Welcome to In the Venn Zone with Christine McKay, where we get candid about what it takes to negotiate effectively. You'll learn from the challenges and successes of entrepreneurs, executives, and experts. We help you change the nature of your negotiations and get more from every deal you do. Hey, everybody, welcome back to another amazing episode of In the Ven Zone, where we help you, the small and mid sized business, elevate your negotiations, take them to a new level, ask for more of what you want, and expect to get it. That's what Maya Angelou said, and I love her. Um, I today am doing something that I have not done before. I have two really awesome guests on the show today. I have first Lauren Yi, and Lauren is a cultivator of curiosity, a builder of community, and a process driven problem solver. She has worked with a ton of companies. She has done, she started, she has her own business and she, one of the cool things about her is that she helped build the largest Lego inspired STEM company in the U S she has worked with the golden state warriors, Google, LinkedIn, Netflix, Southwest airlines and workday and helped them establish inclusivity of programs and create a psychologically safe work environment where their staff can thrive. And I have Jeff Harry. Jeff combines positive psychology and play to help teams organize, na- organizations navigate difficult consult- conversations, assist individuals, all these good stuff. And he has been selected by Bamboo HR and Engagedly, that's a hard word to say, mm-hmm. um, as one of the top 100 HR influencers of 2020. He's been featured in the New York Times, Mashable and Upworthy. And he also also has worked with Google, Microsoft, Southwest Airlines, as well as Adobe, the NFL, Amazon, and Facebook. And I am so excited. This is going to be a fun episode. For those of you who have who have like been around and seen some of our previous episodes, you'll have you'll you're gonna think Chris Tabish. Probably Scott O'Neill's going to come up. My friend Blair Dunkley's going to come up. And we're just going to have a great time here. So welcome, Lauren. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much. So tell, tell us a little bit about your journey, how you each kind of got to where you were, and then how you guys started working together, because you guys have been working together for over a decade and uh, doing all sorts of really cool things, talking about difficult conversations in organizations, bringing play, all these things. Tell us a little bit about that. You want me to go? Lauren, go. Yep, I go first? Okay. Go. Um, uh, well, okay. I will also say that preemptively to that. I feel like there's many origin stories in life, right? Because, you know, there's chapters or however you want to describe it. Um, The sort of summary version of, you know, we all have that thing that we're trying to do and we think we want to do, and then we get there and then you don't like it. Maybe not everybody has that, but I have that. (laughs) I didn't like it. And it's everything that I had worked towards and then was like, I got to get out of here. And that actually led me to feel more open to whatever. Cause I was like, not that. So anything else. Um, and that allowed me to stumble into a job, um, that I never would have thought I ended up in education management, which is where I met Jeff originally. Um, and we like to help people learn through play. And I originally was doing like architecture project management, not, the same uh, and ended up in this and grew and it was fun and the people were cool and we got to do something helpful for kids and grown-ups in teams by learning through play because you got to get out of your own head sometimes and we're all in this together um, and Jeff and I actually grew the team building department there. Um, so that's the quick version um, of that and then um, since we've kind of gone our own ways, but I've started my, uh, my own company and we are helping other people work with better information and more joy, uh, bringing kind of humanity back to work using data and play and community and stuff like that. Because we're all just people trying to get by. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's my brief story, I guess. Awesome. Jeff? 
<laughs> so my Batman origin story starts with the movie Big. Remember with Tom Hanks? Yeah. So I saw You're him dancing on the piano. That's okay. <laughs> exactly. I totally dated myself. Tom Hanks dancing on the piano. Then he's offered a job in a toy company. And I'm like, what? You can do that for a living? So I started writing toy companies in third grade. I did not stop until I started working for the toy industry. And just like Lauren, when I got there, I don't know if you've ever gotten exactly what you wanted and been so disappointed, but that's what happened to me. No play, no fun, no high fives, no kids, none of that. I leave disenchanted, come to the Bay Area, bump into this organization teaching kids engineering with Lego. Seven people at the time founded on Craigslist, paying $150 a week, like a joke of a job, but they were playing for a living. And then we, you know, built into the, one of the largest, you know, like inspired STEM organizations, right? But the thing that, that I learned um, was we had no business plan. We just played. We just were making it up as we went along. We had no idea what we were doing. We picked cities we thought were fun. We picked people that we thought were fun. And we just embraced this like play mindset. So then when Lauren and I were like, the reason why we started doing team building events is because we got the attention of Silicon Valley, all of those companies you mentioned earlier. And they were like, hey, do you do team building events? And we're like, of course we do. <laughs> no, we didn't. We didn't do any of that stuff, but we just said yes. And then for the next decade, Lauren and I got really good at running these. But the thing that, that at least for me, there was the forced fun aspect I did not really appreciate. And I felt like, we had not created psychologically safe spaces to actually play. People were not ready to play because they had not had difficult conversations. They had not addressed the toxic person at work. They did not even know how to talk to each other. You know, so that's why I created Rediscover Your Play to, you know, combine positive psychology and play to address those issues and create a psychologically safe workplace. That's awesome. Well, I'm so excited to have you guys here. Jeff and I met, we were guests on Ottawa Experts not long ago, and uh, we had so much fun. And so, and it actually is really interesting. Part of how we have have both Jeff and Lauren here was... I'd say accidental, but we we don't really know how Lauren got invited, but we're so <laughs> glad she's here because for some reason we're all three supposed to be here today. And so I'm super excited about how this conversation is going to unfold. Let's call um, it serendipitous. It is serendipitous. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, everything on, we bring everything on the show back to kind of negotiation because we're really trying to help everybody elevate their negotiation. So you were talking just a minute ago about difficult conversations. And I just got off the phone with somebody who's looking at buying into a company, but has an attorney that is part of the other company who believes that they should just annihilate everybody. It's all about just kind of, I got to, I got to get you. I got to kill you. I get It's all, I call them champions. So we have a quiz on our website. You can learn your default negotiation style. And we call this style a champion where they go into every negotiation fully armed and fully armored. And it is a battle and their purpose is to annihilate their opponent. How, so when you guys in the work that you do around play and, and just all the, the team building stuff and all the exploratory things you guys do, how, how do you in, encourage people to deal with those kind of individuals? What are some of the things that people can do to help deal with that? I think, oh, okay. So I don't know all of the uh, like names for it on your test, but that the champion feels very, that is hard to deal with because difficult conversations should be a conversation. And that doesn't feel like it would be. That's a lecture. That's, that's the, I'm right. You're wrong. This is how it's going to go. I'm winning. You're like, okay, we're clearly not in this together, which mm -hmm. is, I mean, isn't that part of like the definition of like negotiating and converse? It's like together, like you, there has to be two parts of it. So that's really tough to, um, that can be really tough to manage. Um, and especially depending on your like the power structure, because authority matters. Whether people think it does or doesn't, it does. Um, whether it's real or perceived or any of that. Um, oh, a big thing that I can think of that's really like just basic, but it, it's 
a practice is just the idea that sometimes you can't like if you're on the other side of the winning conversation uh you can't necessarily win that conversation and so it's kind of like you have to go in for the experience if you will like for yourself and for that other person like can we get them to come down from this height a little bit and just give them an experience of not fighting in a sense that they're gonna see us fighting Mm -hmm. um you know voice your opinion be understanding like try to share your side see if you can kind of get closer to a middle Mm -hmm. um it's rough but it's not going to happen overnight there's not a special light switch that you can just turn on and so it's all about practice which is tough yeah it takes time and and i'll borrow a line from lauren about like the curiosity aspect of it right what does it mean for that person to win for the champion to win like yep. what are the what are the what are the criteria for that person to win let's not assume let's actually find out because maybe maybe we still both can win by simply finding is it their ego do they need some praise during the meeting before we start negotiating numbers like let's let's play this game with them instead of assuming that we know where they're coming from because we know the last dude bro that we we worked with like because i think a lot of times when we're having a conversation we we talked about this before you're not just having that conversation here you're having every conversation you've had before and all the trauma that comes from that and you have to you have to be very aware of how that's affecting how you're approaching this this conversation right now in the present moment I love that. So Blair Dunkley, who is one of my mentors and has been a guest on the show, talks about people being stuck in their their why. And when you're stuck in your why, when people like ask the question why, it's like you respond with a rationalization and justification, all these different things. And it's all stuck in the past. And so when, you know, and and the person I was talking to about this earlier today around this difficult conversation, I told him, I said, the biggest challenge you're going to have is how you figure out how this attorney has everybody stuck in their past, because you've got to move that person from that past into the present with a mind toward the future, but you got to get them to the present. Cause if you can't get them to the present, then having that conversation, then the difficulty of that conversation is going to continue. That Um, is so huge. The thing about so much, too much of what happens with, I think people in, um, well, just difficult people in situations, people get stuck in the trauma in the past, but it should be about the present and the future. Because we can't change the past. It's rumination. I talk about that with Jeff a lot. It's like, it's can be helpful to an extent in terms of like, uh, like figuring out how we got here, but in the terms of why didn't I, I should have, okay, that doesn't really, you can't do anything about it then. So like, you can think about it in the sense of moving forward, but we got to be here now together. Mm -hmm. And if you can't get there, you can't move forward. You might be sort of making like physical actual steps, but in terms of functioning and actual progress and all of that part of it, like the actual part of it, it it's not going to happen if you can't get to past the past. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I also think like the champion, I would come up with a different word for that, starting with the letter A, but like the champion <laughs> of, uh, uh, mindset, they're very insecure, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of weakness behind it. And I, and I was mentioning this earlier, like there's this book called The Power Manual and they talk about, they talk all about power, right? And, you know, and like in every interaction that we have, we're, we're choos- choosing either consciously or unconsciously to be in a place of power or a pa- place of powerlessness, right? And when you're in a place of power, you know, what type of power are you choosing? Are you choosing supremacist power, which is like, I got to win, I got to slay the dragon, domination, submission, you know, and it, because that comes from like a scarcity consciousness, like there's not enough to go around, you know? Mm-hmm. So I, I got to win and everyone else is going to starve. Or can you come from a place of like liberatory power where like there's abundance consciousness, it's egalitarian and like raise all boats. And, and is it even possible to shift that champion into that? Because that champion is insecure because they're out there all alone. 
They've constantly been winning. And because they've been winning so much, no one likes them. No one likes them. So their only value now is winning. So we, you know, when you're coming from a place of empathy and compassion and being like, well, what does it mean to win for you? Let me get you your win but let's actually also move this negotiation forward because we don't have time for this. You're losing money and I'm losing money. We're both losing right now. So let me help you win, you know, stroke your ego, but let's get some stuff done. I like that. I like that a lot because the, when, when you're at the table and you, I'll, I, let me tell a story of the, I had a guy once and um, some people will listen to the, go, this and go, Oh my God, Christine, that's a terrible thing to do. But I had a guy who was very much, uh, he was very much a champion. He hated everybody. He attacked everybody in, in both on, well, if you ever would get a phone call because he would never pick up the phone and actually talk to you. So he spewed vitriol through his emails um, to across like multiple organizations. And we happen to have common connections in our in our network. And so I reached out to some of them and asked them about them, about this guy. And their response back to me was, I am so sorry that you have to deal with this guy. So in, you know, in, we'd been trying to get him to the table and trying to get in the table and he just would not come and he wouldn't move. So I did, because I'm from Montana. So I stepped on the head of the rattlesnake. I just kind of went, okay, I got to move him so far that he gets pissed off in order to get something to, to shake loose from here. Now I should have talked to my boss before I did it, but <laughs> which I didn't, that, that, that in hindsight was the only regret I had about the situation. Um, mm. But so I, he sent this really nasty email. I replied with one sentence and I said, it's good to know that our mutual connections are right about you. <laughs> that was all I said. Right now, I knew that that was going to really make him mad. Right. But I needed to do something. Being nice wasn't working. Trying to cajole him wasn't working. He needed so much. To, he, he was so invested in being angry all the time that the only way to get him to actually negotiate was to make him more angry. And and so I got in the next morning and he had written this like insanely long letter to the chairman of the board, the CEO, the CFO, the COO, the two vice presidents of sales. And, and it was just this long diatribe in response to my one sentence. Now, the way that I wrote it could have been taken in either direction. Right. Oh, we have mutual connections. Who are they? I'd love to, I'd love to connect, right? right. It, it could have gone that way, but he chose to take it in this really negative, dark way. And sometimes you, when you're dealing with conflict and you're and at the table and you're trying to get somebody to do something, sometimes you have to do some things that are kind of dramatic and drastic in order to, and, and I, I still negotiated that deal, but the attorney became kind of the mouthpiece for the deal because the guy wouldn't talk to me. Not that he talked to me before, but we got him to the table. Yes. So that was successful in a strategy. So I'm curious kind of what you guys' thoughts are on that and feel free to criticize it. It's totally fine because it happened years ago, but um, <laughs> but it was, it was, it was, I didn't know what else to do at the time. And it was like, yeah, when you, when you have that difficult conversation that somebody you have to have, but somebody's not willing to have it. How do you, how do you do that? Well, I, I love the play of it. I love the experimentation of it. That's what I love. I love that you're like, we've tried everything. So I'm going to try something else. Like, I'm going to rock the boat. Like, what's what's wrong with this? Because everything else y'all are doing is not working. So that, I, I, I respect that. Not to mention, I'm all about setting boundaries on really horrible, toxic behavior. And it's just like, that needs to stop anyway. So call that person out. I love it. I agree. And also, good for you. There's, okay, so there's like a level of... Um, everyone has their own version of what, where, where they might draw their line. Yours seems pretty high, which I appreciate. Um, Cause there's the, there's the level of ask for 
forgiveness, not permission. Right. And you're just like, I just got to do something. And I can appreciate that. Yeah. It was like, maybe, maybe the boss asking mentioning would have been a good move, but you know, we all, we've, we've learned now. And now if you ever have to do that again, you'll ask or throw it out there that I'm going to send this email, but there's this thing of um, like the play uh, curiosity, like the, if you're too comfortable and things aren't working, you're just going to sit in that and nothing's going to change. And it's just me chair. I'm like, this is your new, this is where I live now. And if you want something to move forward or progress, you have to get uncomfortable sometimes. Mm. And that doesn't, it's not always at that level, hopefully for people, <laughs> but you, sometimes you have to try, like we've tried everything else and it's not working. So either this is just how it's going to be and we're okay with that or we're not. And it's just going to be terrible or we're going to try something else. And the idea of like the possibility and again, it not being like, I'm going to stick it to him, but like kind of, but not really, but questionably neutral ground. Like it's like a, the safest version of what could have happened probably. Um, and, and Lauren brings up a really good point of like that, you know, I think at a lot of companies when we've been there for so long, we're like, there's such this philosophy of like, well, this is how it's always done. So this is how we're always going to do it. But it's like, dude, no one's happy. <laughs> like, no one's happy with this approach. Why are we still here? Like, well, you know, I, well, I'm thinking we should try this new thing out. Oh, we tried that 10 years ago. Do it again. Like, like it's different. It's again. Like, it's been 10 years. Like, the amount of, of lack of wonder yeah. and lack of willingness try something new and experiment is why your organization, and I emphasize this, will become obsolete in the post-pandemic if you do not get your act together and own the resiliency. You know, and I say this a lot, like Stephen Johnson says, the future is where people are having the most fun. And look at the organizations that were having the most fun. They were willing to fail. They were willing to take risks. You know, HBO, we're going to come out with like a movie every week, you know, like, you know, Clubhouse, TikTok, like these crazy weird organizations that most people would be like, this is a horrible idea. No one's going to hop on an audio app for hours. Guess what? You were wrong. You know, so we, the, the companies that are most willing to fail are going to be the companies that are be most willing, will most likely to succeed. Mm. I like the idea of failure as part of play. Oh my gosh. It's such a huge part of it. It's everything. I, I, lo I love it. Go ahead, Lauren. I mean, okay. So the uh, related to what we were just talking about and failure, the, uh, the phrases that I hear that like kind of make my skin crawl a little bit when I hear them are the like, well, this is how we've always done it. Or like, if it ain't broke, don't fi like, don't fix it. But I get that to an extent where you're like, okay, like don't mess up a thing that's like functioning. Okay. But also like challenge it a little bit. Cause there's the sort of opposite part of that phrase of if you don't like if you like there's no change without change sort of you know like like if it ain't broke don't fix it yeah but also uh then you're just stuck and doing nothing and so like play okay jeff and i talk about like play and curiosity and what that looks like together a lot and um play doesn't always mean things to grown-ups it's like recess and board games, but it's not, it's not that. It's about being present and engaged and losing track of time and being excited about whatever, which could be reading or knitting or running. I don't like running, but some people do. <laughs> um, but like, whatever it is, it's like whatever it is where you're present and enjoying it and losing track of time and engaged and like not thinking about all the things that you should be doing instead. And there's, it's, there's so much possibility with that because it doesn't necessarily matter what the outcome is. Like sometimes there's purpose ish, but sometimes there's not. And kind of like what Jeff was just saying about all of the companies that aren't willing to fail and try and challenge and new things, industries and individuals, it, everything's changing. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this before where um, like esports weren't, that was not a thing like a decade ago 
And those people are just like, I like playing this game and I'm getting super good at it. I'm going to play with people from all over the world. And then suddenly they're making so much money. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't, re that wasn't like a, I want to be that when I grow up, that became a thing. And there's so much opportunity to be seized. If you're interested in something, you're going to get there. And there, other people are also probably interested, but they're also may or may not be trying to get there. Mm -hmm. So if you're willing to try and fail and retry and because you're interested, there's so much like power and energy and possibility and opportunity in that, that I just want people to grab. <laughs> And, and also, I think of a, a colleague of Lauren and ours, you know, that that she was out of Colorado um, that used to work for NASA. She worked on the Mars rover and their goal when they were working on the rover was to break it. They wanted to break it and fail all the time. That was their main goal for two to three years because they understood when they sent it to Mars and it was 1.5 million miles away, they can't do anything anymore. So there's something about like actually trying to fail and, and embracing that, that concept mm. and sitting in that and being okay being in the awkwardness of this. Like you, even what you did where you were like, I sent this email and we're like, well, that was a really bad idea. Hey, it's he's at the table, isn't he? Like, yeah. yo, like, at least I'm willing to try things. Like, this is part of the process. You know, now we have a new strategy we might want to incorporate in the future. <laughs> like, this is how we learn. The, and I the think learning. a lot of times we're constantly looking for the correct way of doing things. And play is all about being like, what is your right way? What's the right way for you? Mm. Based off of what's on going on right now. Situation. Like in this situation, being present in the moment right now and trusting your intuition, following your flow instead of being like, somebody tell me what to do. Because I know a lot of people in 2020 were like, ah, what should I do? And, and it was like, guess what? No one knows. No one knows what to do right now. We, no one knows. And anyone that's claiming that they know, knows nothing. They're BSing just like everybody else, you yeah, know. And none of us have been in this before. Right. We're, all, we're all making mistakes and and like failing, but that's there's so many quotes on failure, right? Then they're great, but it's just like fail the like failure. If you think of failure as failure, then that's what it is. It's like a self fulfilling mm -hmm. prophecy, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're if you what I call like when I'm when I'm talk about curiosity, if you're curious. It's like about learning and understanding. And if I'm learning and understanding, I know that I don't know and I'm gonna make mistakes because I don't know. And if you can own that, then your failures or mistakes are just learning new ways that things do or don't work. And you're honing a craft or a skill or your relationship with somebody, but it's not, it's not failure or it's like you can label it as failure, but it's not as scary and terrible and like life or death feeling as so many people like label it as it's just it's just a word right well I, I think that's a good point and this is something that Blair Dunkley talks about is the importance of naming and labeling things and and putting a name and a label to it so that you can deal with it and you know especially when you're in conversation with somebody else and you feel something or you're reacting a certain way well put a label on it and, and acknowledge it, you know, does acknowledging you can, you can say, okay, this is just how I'm feeling. And it doesn't mean that it needs to change your behavior or anything. Just, oh, I'm mad right now, or I'm happy or I'm whatever the emotion is. It just is. And, you know, you can move forward with it. And when you play and you, you're experimenting and trying new things. And if you let that, if you let your emotions kind of get control of you, then that takes you fully away from play. I yep. Think. Yeah. Yep. And and also I think of like from the negotiator standpoint, when someone's like negotiating for one of the first times, you know, crappy first drafts. Embrace your crappy first draft. Guess what? It's not going to go that well. It's okay. You just started. You just started. Have some compassion and empathy for yourself, right? You're going to be better in six months. Just keep trying. Like, mm -hmm. make the mistakes, know that they're going to come, and just embrace that. Mm -hmm. And you'll be amazed. But I think the people that are less likely to be like, oh, I don't want to make any mistake, guess what? You're not going to learn then. You're not going to grow. And you won't be a better negotiator six months from now. You'll be, you'll be mailing it in because you're going to be doing what's what some book told you 
and and you're following that, but you don't really know how to negotiate from your intuition. You don't really know how to listen to yourself because you're trying to be right. Stop trying to be right. Mm. Yeah, because every yeah. person's different and every situation's different from childhood through adulthood. Like that happens constantly. Like I'm different from you, from you and our group of people versus me with like two other people. It's it's a totally different thing and you have to use your experience to shape it but it can't like it's not going to be the same every way every time forever that's not how it works and uh, oof, just I think that kind what something that Jeff touched on is is the practice right it's a crappy first draft like it's my first time doing it I'm learning I'm going to make mistakes and it's going to feel kind of bad but I'll learn from it and it's fine and it, we all have to fail and try and have a first time at some point. And I think that practice, like practice doesn't make perfect practice makes progress. And we Mm. don't as adults get to practice enough things that we're expected to know how to do. Um, But we also, I don't think give ourselves enough credit for actually having practiced certain things that we need to do. Like even in negotiating, I, I, as you were saying things like this, where you're like, oh, I got to do this thing and I have to do this with this other person. And I'm afraid of doing it right or wrong. It's like parenting. Like you yeah. negotiate what you have to negotiate with your kids constantly. Right. Where you're just like, brush your teeth. No, <laughs> like take a nap, like get in the car. Um, you have, you like, maybe not as much with pets. Like, come here, I'm going to trick you with food, <laughs> but you negotiate with friends. Like, what are we going to do to hang out? I don't want to see that. You negotiate all the time, but for whatever reason, when it suddenly becomes business, it gets so much scarier, which I get because it's like professional. There's like maybe money and jobs and career and like, it's scarier, but you have the skills. It's their transferable skills. It's the same skill. It's just a different situation environment and know that you've practiced and it's just a different situation to practice some more. And maybe it'll be a little less scary. (laughs) Well, it's inter- that's interesting because a lot of times, so, so for a lot of the people that I work with, um, so I, I have two different sides of my business. So one is kind of more of a training component, but the bulk, bulk of my business is actually, I, we go in and we negotiate on behalf of our clients. And a lot of our clients just are terrified of negotiation, a lot of them. And it's just like, they're afraid of the confrontation. They're afraid, they're just... They don't, they're, they're, they're worried about asking for the wrong thing or not asking for enough, or if they ask too much, then the customer will walk out the door. If they don't ask for enough, then they feel walked on. Kind of how does the concept of, of play come into the negotiations we have with ourselves? Because in, I talk a lot about how the hardest part of any negotiation is a negotiation we have between our ears. And mm-hmm. how, how does, how do we, how do we help ourselves play more in our own heads to experience this and then, and then act out in that, in those moments um, in a way that moves conversation forward. So, so I'll, I'll start by saying like expectations of the thief of joy, right? And when we build up such high expectations, then it's all about winning. And if I don't get this one result, this is where I think a lot of suffering comes from adults. We're so fixated on that one result that we ignore all of the other opportunities that are happening in front of us, right? And then I talk a lot about this in like my play, playing with your inner critic workshop, where it's just like your rational mind is designed to keep you alive. It's designed for survival. Your prefrontal cortex, your inner critic, it is there to protect you. That's why it's there. But a lot of times we lean on our rational mind and we ask it, should I take this risk? And it's like, no, you should binge watch Netflix and and sleep under a duvet. Like don't do anything ever, right? (laughs) When we should be leaning on our intuitive mind and our creative mind and our curious mind to be like, what what is possible, right? So what one thing I do when I'm playing with my inner critic, and I do this with my best friend, Dana, is I'll actually write down what my inner critic is saying to me. So in a negotiation, I would be like, or or going into the negotiation, like my inner critic's like, you're going to lose. You're going to lose so much money. You're the worst. You're the worst negotiator ever. Like, all, I just write all the worst things down. Because once you write them down, you make yourself very aware. And you start to practice that muscle of awareness, which is most probably the most important one, self-awareness. And sometimes I'll text my best friend, 
Dana and I'll actually name my inner critic. I'll think about what it looks like, what it sounds like, and I'll name it. Mine is Gargamel. And I'll be like, Dana, Gargamel is telling me that I'm a horrible negotiator and that I will not get a good deal and I will not make money and all this stuff. And as soon as I write it down, it gets quiet that integrated mm. quiet. And then one thing that I've recently learned to do that's kind of fun is then I'll take the same things I just wrote down and I'll flip them and be like, I am an actual good negotiator. You know, I I will actually do well, well in this negotiation. I am confident about what I'm talking about. When you flip those, you start to create this like inner child mantra and you start saying that to yourself, all of a sudden your inner child gets really strong and your inner critic gets really quiet. And you just do techniques like that going to a meeting and you do some power posing from Amy Cuddy and look, yo, dude, like watch out what might happen. Something magical might happen. I love that. I love that. Lauren, were you going to say something? I feel like sort of, I don't know if because of the decades of work we did with kids and team building and using Lego materials, but I feel like so often I, not to be like, treat people or yourselves like kids, but kind of because we have so much grace for kids and then we don't extend that to anybody else. And it, 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 I'm reminded of this over and over and over. And like, even what Jeff is saying, I the generalized versions, right, are when you have kids or like when kids, okay, kids are like telling you like, mom, mom, mom. You're like, okay, I hear you. It's the address and move on. Like, cool. I can't talk to you about that right now, but I'm going to, when I'm finished this, I'm going to ask you about whatever TV show you're telling about. So it's address and move on, which is what Jeff is doing with the inner critic. Mm -hmm. Like I hear you and I'm choosing to ignore you or like, I, okay, got it. We'll come back to this later. Cause I hear you. I need to move forward. It's the dress and move on sort of principle. Um, mm -hmm. and then also just the idea that, um, we tend, we've, I don't know how we've done this as humanity, but again, so much is a practice because we have practice and condition into whoever we are, however we are today. And we can practice out of that, but it takes practice because we have gotten so good at like when someone wants, if a friend asks you, oh, I'm thinking about doing this potentially risky thing. A lot of the encouraging thing that a lot of people say is, what's the worst that could happen? And we go to the negative, but it's just like, mm. what's the best thing that could happen? Can we like flip this a little? Like Jeff does with his, like all of it's bad and flip it to, uh, I am a good negotiator. I can get a good deal because there is, there's reality to that sort of self-talk. It's going to go however you think it's going to go to an extent. And um, like you were talking about when you're in your own head about it, it's, a waste of imagination to put yourself down. Yeah. Like you have so much power in what you're doing in your own head. And if you're smashing yourself down, you could be doing so much more with that same energy, but in a better way, which is a mindset shift. So like the practice of maybe even like writing it down or telling a friend and asking for a cheerleader. Mm. Um, yeah. There's, there's a thing like when we want to, I've talked to Jeff about this, where you want, if you want to get something done, on your own or like with your company, you need accountability because sometimes it's hard to do on your own because we make excuses like binge watching Netflix. Um, <laughs> but it helps to have uh, three different people to help you do that. And we talk about them being like a scorekeeper, like, did you do it? Did you didn't do it? Like that's, that's their only job. That's mm -hmm. it. A coach who will help you like figure out how to get there if you can't on your own, but like they're kind of like your buddy in it. Or yeah. if something didn't work or you fail or make a mistake, like, cool, here's how we're going to adjust and move on. And a cheerleader, because when things don't work out or you're doing the negative self-talk, you could be like, oh, this is hard. And they're like, you're awesome. Stop talking like that to yourself. You can totally this. Do you remember when last week you did that other thing? You're amazing. Or just like make you feel good when you hang out with them, even if they're not actively cheerleading you. Like you need that energy and hopefully it can come for yourself. But if it doesn't like ask for help. Mm, yeah, uh, that's good. Yeah, that's, I, I think that's important. And I think that when people, so many people find negotiation to be an intimidating thing. And so when, but part of that, especially for smaller companies, is that it's often the owner that is going in to do the negotiation and mm -hmm. they don't have what you just described. They mm -hmm. oftentimes don't have that, that cheerleader. They don't have that, you know, person who's kind of in it with, in it, in it with them or the person who's keeping them on task. They feel very isolated and very alone. 
and to your point, Jeff, and, and, and that, that starts to, when people are operating in that world, then they start listening to that inner critic and that inner critic just gets louder and louder and louder. And it becomes very, very challenging for a lot of people to ask for more of what they want because they're, they're just so fixated on, you know, that I got to stay safe. So don't ask kind of thing. Right. And I even remember, I can't believe I'm bringing this up because I haven't talked about this in a while, but I used to do family law. I was like a legal assistant when I first moved to the Bay area and watching those divorce cases, no one ever won because they never, it was never, it was never enough for either party. Like the negotiations, like it was so much pain and suffering for each party as they were fighting. I remember one person was fighting over like a golden toilet bowl cover. Like it was like, it was like that. It was that level of just sadness as you're like doing your schedules of assets and debts. Um, but I think of like this play technique that I, I learned from this like self-improvement comedian, Kyle Cease, who would do these things called Kai Legos. And you could do this in negotiation. He would do this for his acting tryouts where with his friend Diego, they would talk to each other before the tryout and be like, and describe as if it already happened and describe mm -hmm. like, you can't believe how that negotiation happened. Oh my gosh, we got all of the things that we wanted. You know, it went really smoothly. Oh, that person, I was expecting them to attack me and they didn't. And you start to say this back to yourself or you tell this to someone as if it already happened and then what is happening in the prefrontal cortex and from positive psychology is you're you're starting to look for patterns you're looking for mm. patterns of how it can actually get good and you can even ask the question you know while you're in the negotiation how can it get any better than this with a certain level of curiosity right not, and not yearning like it gotta get better right and when you're coming from that place, then you're going to be you're going to be more calm, more patient, more willing to look for all of the opportunities, more in flow. Because when you're in flow, you see all of the opportunities in front of you. Because your implicit mind shows up, you become highly creative, and your inner critic actually dissipates. Like sports players say that all the time, their inner critic dissipates because I got to make decisions so quickly like that. Mm -hmm. So we want to get in a state of flow when you're in that negotiation so you can be fully present and respond directly to what's going on in the moment. I love that. Um, I just, I just did help a friend go through a divorce. Um, she and her husband had been married for over 20 years. They're both in their seventies and they had a huge ranch that they were selling. And um, it started with her, with him, with her saying, I can't deal with him. He's going to send me the spreadsheet. He's taken everything, blah, 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 kind of thing. And so I get, she's like, could you just talk to him? Cause I can't talk to him. I can't listen to him. Anytime he opens his mouth, I just get angry kind of thing. Well, he was it started out with him saying, well, these are the numbers and I'm taking 70%. She gets 30. And if she doesn't like it, she can sue me. That's just the way it is. And so two or three days later, I got him to agree to give her 100%. And then she gave him 50% back plus $50,000 that he had loaned her for her business. And she what calls it a magic. good karma. Are you, what magic are you creating? <laughs> Who are you, an alchemist? What is this? It really, it really was about, it was about, they had one common thing. They had two things in common still. One, they wanted to preserve, they wanted to know that they hadn't thrown away 20 years of their life on a, on, with a, in a relationship with someone that they hated. Mm. They, that, that, that's important. Nobody wants to look back at X amount of time they spent with somebody and go, oh my God, that's the worst time of my life. Nobody what wants a, that. What a waste. What right. a waste. What a waste. I what wasted a 20 years of my life with that person. Nobody right. wants to say that. Right. And they had grandkids. <laughs> so it was all about, it was all about, so she's, so when, when he'd given her a hundred percent, then she started doing the, well, I invested more. I did more. I blah, 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 blah. And I said to her, I said, so what are you going to do when we get off the phone today? And so she told me, and I said, did what you did at the ranch seven years ago, five years ago, three years ago, what influence did that have on what you're going to do right after we get off the phone? None. 
is what Tom did five years ago, three years ago, last year. Does that influence what you're going to do when you hang up the phone? No. In 10 years, when you look back at this moment in time, what do you want to say about yourself? And the next day she gave him half plus the $50,000 uh, paid back the loan that he gave her. And, you know, and I think that, you know, when we you talk, when people talk about negotiation in this kind of this, you know, win, lose, I, if I, you know, I've got, a, I got a piece of pie and, or I've got a, a whole pie, right? And if I give you a piece, that means that I don't get access to that piece. But there's actually research that shows that the average negotiation we think of as, we'll call it a hundred, right? We're negotiating for a hundred. Mm-hmm. In reality, there's 142 of value. There's 42% more value in the average negotiation than people realize because they're not thinking about possibilities. Mm -hmm. They're not playing with options. They're not exploring. uh, They're not, they're just not discovering and they're not in that, how do I have that curiosity? How do I, okay, so you, you want this, Okay, so what does that really mean? Kind of going back to what you said, and how many ways can I get there, right? It's not just, I want this. It's like, how do we get there? The process is more important than the content. Yes. Another another Blair Dunkley thing, right? That, that he talks a lot about, about being in the process versus being content. And in negotiation, people focus on the content. What's the price? What's What am I getting out of it? But it's the process of negotiation, which is where the discovery, the curiosity, the exploration is. And that's where the value is. Okay. I go, go, Lauren, Lauren's so like, for, for people, and, and be, before, before you dive in, I, before Lauren answers that everyone, if, this is like such an awesome episode. We are having so much fun. If you go to Ven, V-E-N-N dot zone, you can actually get the full transcript of this conversation. And, uh, and if you do that, we got a gift for you too. So um, go check out Ven dot zone and uh, Lauren dive in. Okay. So the thing that you're saying without saying the word that it kept floating in my head was people have conversations all the time, but when negotiation becomes the label, it's about a transaction and nobody wants to mm. feel like a transaction. And that's like, reminds me of what you're talking about, like with like the divorce things, right? Cause you're literally like disagreeing on stuff most of the time. Um, and in a very mundane but feelings way when jeff and i worked for this uh learning through play lego company um we would go to conferences to like meet people like talk about programs and do stuff like that and because we you know rep not rep lego but we utilized lego um we had like lego bow ties and like hair, hair clips and so like i'd wear one and we would bring like a couple for like the cool people that we met because we're like you're really cool like I want you to have a present because we're friends. It's like a friendship bracelet for adults. Yeah. Yep. With Lego. Um, but we would have these and it kind of got known because people would just be like, oh, that's so cool. And we're like, oh yeah, thanks. And we'd talk about it. And then I'd be like, do you, do you want one? Because you're really cool and I like you. Um, and kind of just have, but then like people at the conference would then have them and it would kind of get around because, you know, a lot of, a lot of times at conference, there's like swag from whoever else is there. And people would ask like, Oh, where'd you get that? And they're like, Oh, like from this person, not from a booth. And for, it's such a small thing, but it's about, it's about how people, how you make people feel. And Mm -hmm. I remember one time at a conference where somebody came or someone came up to me and they were like, Hey, like, where'd you get that? Like Lego thing. I was like, Oh, I, 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 I made it and brought it like I it's I brought it (laughs) and they're like oh I heard so are you the person who like has them I was like I mean I guess so and there's like how do I get one of those like um well we could start with what's your name I'm Lauren and then they're like okay cool and I was just like do you want to ask answer a fun weird question for me because we were it's like mingly time and this is one of my favorite things to do at conferences when I meet new people and they're like okay sure and then I asked them a question and like it was a random question they responded and like 
so did I, do I get one now? And I was like, you got to stop asking that. Like that's the first, the first pathway to getting this is to stop asking me how to get it because you're making me angry and I don't want to give you one because I was a transaction. They didn't care about me and I don't want to care about you if you don't want to care about me. And that's when, like, yes, it is about a transaction, but it's not the only thing. It's there's so much more to it. Like you're saying, like in like, what people are thinking is or isn't possible or what you're actually talking about, whether you're talking about it and using the same word, but it holds more meaning for different people in different mm. ways. And you can't figure that out without having the conver- the bigger conversations around the conversation to figure out what is your winning? What is your win or like whatever you want to call it. Um, and like even the past you, future you, like how do we feel about that? Those are important things because they're all filtering into this one tiny thing that has so much more weight to it that I think Mm. that people have a hard time fully understanding in the moment because there's just so much going on internally and with this other person with other entity or whatever about this one thing but it's not it's never about the one thing right Yeah. yeah you've you've built up such a story around that one number and if I don't get that number and like it's what it means to you lost. versus what it means or doesn't mean to them. Yeah. It's very like groomzilla, bridezilla, where it's like, if my day is not perfect, then it's all. And you're like, you're surrounded by all the people that you love. You're missing out on all of the possible connections. And, and Lauren's story like inspired, you know, reminded me of, of Shia LaBeouf, who was actually talking at Oxford Union. And he was talking about give and take. And he goes, he knows when someone wants a selfie. He can feel it. He can feel it as they're having the conversation with them because they're building up to ask for the selfie and he can feel the take of it. But there are other times when he's talking to people and they're giving and he can feel the give. And then it just so happens, hey, you want a selfie because we've been talking for a while. Maybe we can do that. And I think that's what we have to be aware of when going into negotiation. What am I doing right now? What is my give? How am I giving to this negotiation? How am I as uh, one of my play mentors, Kevin Carroll would say, how am I making this not a transactional conversation, but a transformational conversation? And that's Uh, what you did for them is you turned it into a transformational conversation. You know, they were all about the numbers and you were like, well, what do you want to think about when you look back 10 years from now? Oh, when you said that to me, I was like, oh my gosh. How do I want to think about this? How do I want to be as a human being? Transformational. So we need to be asking ourselves, how am I incorporating a transformational process into this and not just focusing on just the transaction? Mm, I love that. I mean, my my motto is, and, and I'm on a mission to change how people think about negotiation, that negotiation should not be about a transaction. Negotiation is a conversation about a relationship and you cannot win a relationship. You can get more value out of it though. And so it's really, how do you, how do, how, how do we elevate the whole thing of negotiation? And I mean, even like a car dealership, right? You know, like people go and buy a car and they're going to negotiate for the car. And, and I bought two cars for the price of one plus $5,000 once. And I, and people, I mean, I went to the dealer saying, I'm going to buy two cars, but I'm going to only pay you for one. And people are like, oh my God, who'd do that? That's a horrible thing. But there were circumstances that I knew because I'd done my work. I'd done the work to do the research. I understood the market. I understood who the buyers were. I understood how the company made business, how, how they, how they made money. I understood what the salesperson needed. I understood how they sold. And I realized that it was actually beneficial for them at that moment in time, at that specific moment in time, in that specific situation to sell me two cars for the price of one. I was wrong on the holding costs. So I increased the offer by five grand. So it was like, all right, so correct me, but but it was a good deal for them. And it created a great relationship because at one point when they were pretending to be really upset with me for putting that offer out there, (laughs) I I looked and it was like Friday night. And I looked at my husband, I said, it's date night, we got to go. And if you leave the lot, then you're probably not going to buy. But I looked at the the manager who was kind of red in the face over the whole whole process because he's never had somebody do this before. I looked at him and I said, so what are you doing this weekend? It's Friday night. You're working. You must have tomorrow off. I said, what are you up to this weekend? 
right? It goes back to the relationship that it's never about one thing. And he's like, oh, he's like taken aback by the, the question. And he's like, well, I'm really, we were in Massachusetts and he's like, I'm really into dog sled racing. I have a race tomorrow. And I said, oh my gosh, I'm from Montana. And the Iditarod winner two years in a row is from Montana. We happen to have a standard poodle at the time. That year, there was huge controversy over poodles racing in the Iditarod because some had died. And so we got into a whole conversation about the Iditarod, for Christ's sake. And it created relationship. And so then once that relationship started to develop, that it wasn't a transaction, it's a relationship, then it's like, okay, so now what do we do about this transaction? These are all the assumptions I have. Where are my assumptions wrong? So it was relationship plus transparency. Because I think that, so this gentleman I was just talking to today, uh, this attorney who's very value taking and is a total champion, they play everything very close to the vest. You can't build a relationship if you are not transparent, if there's not some level of transparency. So in order to have a a really effective relationship, you have to have a level of transparency. But how do we build that when we're in situations where we've been conditioned not to be transparent, like in a negotiation, people are like, Oh my God, I'm afraid if I share, if I share this information, then if, I mean, I, I say, I often say that there are two big things that prevent us from being successful negotiators. One is fear, the fear of being judged. And two is that we're constantly operating from the position that our counterpart is out to get us. Yeah. Right. So Trans- so that prevents that second belief prevents us from being transparent because we're afraid that if we disclose more information, that that weakens us, that it puts us in a weak position. But how can we how can we switch that around to to say to say um, by being transparent, it actually improves the relationship and creates greater outcomes. So, so when Lauren and I run workshops, you know, we're again, all about play, right? And when you are showing up with a certain level of play and be willing to be a little silly, you start to be a little bit more vulnerable. You start to Mm. start actually showing. So we don't start off with like, let's actually start talking about the thing that is most tense in the room. Let's address that right now. No, let's start small. Let's build up from here. When we're running our, you know, how to you know navigate difficult conversations talk and we're like all right we're we're blaming okay we're blaming people and blah 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 hey instead of blaming people let's blame this goat we're going to blame this scapegoat and all of the anger and everything's going to go at the goat and then when you start to do things that are silly and you start to do things that you realize like you know is it that serious the the again the reason why we're so tense is because we're fixated on one result of like, mm. I need to win right now. We, what we try to do is we're trying to get people out of their head. Right. And when you start to have them practice and do role playing and doing all these other things, focusing on something else, that's much easier to negotiate first. Right. Mm. Let's, mm. Ne- let's debate whether, you know, deep dish pizza or thin crust is a thing. And people get super passionate about that. And then we do some other absurd thing, right? You know, should you have mustard on a hot dog or not on a hot dog? Oh my God, you know, and then you like, you're arguing these ridiculous things and you build up from there. Then people feel more comfortable just even having, I'm exchanging words with you and you're exchanging words with me and we have not gotten angry at each other yet Mm. because we're not talking about the subject. And after we've done that enough times, then we finally bring the actual subject in and be like, all right, Mm. now let's address this because Mm -hmm. we've now practiced lifting smaller weights than heavier weights. And now we're ready to actually lift the real weight. Got it. Yeah. I love that. I think that that's why the, um, your, your question's like, it's a heavy, hard question to like, how do we flip the script? You're like, Ooh, well you, you can't just, you can't just do that because it is, it's a, you have to find little ways to practice always practice getting out of your own head and whether that's um like with like actively doing silly things or it's because what is it what it's about eventually like what you're talking about trying to change how negotiation is seen is it's like we're humans 
and it's not a transaction. And we, so being able to practice that or get used to that, it's, if you think about it the other way, right? If I'm negotiating with some big company about something and it's like me against them, um, if I am like, here are the facts and here's what I want. And I think that I'm proving a good point. That's fair and fine. But if it were like flipped, it's, it's like the idea when people use it in marketing all the time, but when like big companies say good things or like, look at this good stuff we're doing. Sometimes it's marketing, sometimes it's real, but like as a person, if you're like, look at this good stuff or who I am as a person, you can connect more, more and you're like more willing to go there for the people you know more about. Like if you're at a networking event, like just people to people, whatever networking mm-hmm. event, you're just like, nice to meet you. What's your name? Where are you from? What do you do? And none of that means anything. But when you talk about an Iditarod or it's like, oh, we both learned how to knit during the pandemic. Or I also have a goldfish. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but like finding random little ways to connect. It's like a practice of opening up, especially since in Thai, in the last bit here, we've all been a lot more isolated. Not everyone's as practiced as um, some others in digital, virtual, remote work and we are out of practice with people and finding little ways to do that even at like grocery stores when I've just been like hey how's it going people are like what like people people don't talk to me um or like when toll booths used to be a thing with like humans I would like take my sunglasses off and be like hey how's it going here's the money okay bye like you're a human and I'm a human and practicing that in little ways it like it, it's that feedback too, where if I practice and it doesn't go terribly and if they light up more then I'm like, Ooh, then I'm going to light up more. And so it, it gets you, it builds up that muscle, but you have to do it in li- find little ways that you're comfortable in trying. Um, or kind of like Jeff was saying before, like priming your brain to see the patterns of why it's good to share information. It's the same thing, especially with social media, when people, sometimes when somebody gets like a viral post, just like, oh my gosh, me too. Like someone shared a really vulnerable fail moment or like a weird conversation they have, or like, they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I just did this. But they share and everyone's like, yes, likes, me too, retweet, all the things, because we don't want to share it, but you did. And I feel for you Mm -hmm. because that's me. (laughs) And so trying to realize that can be really helpful, but again, in safer, smaller ways to, so you get more comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. Got it. I would also uh, say connecting to the why, if you went into a negotiation with with two companies and you were like, well, why do you work here? What do you love about this organization? And then another person says, what do I love about this organization? And you start finding out the backstory behind this. And like, why are we here today? What do you hope to get out of this? And you start to humanize that individual. Mm-hmm. That's so much more powerful. They, We want to connect as human beings, you know? And the only reason why we want to win or win the transaction is because we feel like that's going to bring us happiness when really what we want is the connection. Mm -hmm. Awesome. This has been really, really awesome. I love it. So I have a couple of questions that I'm going to ask you. So I'm, this is new for me. So I decided to, how do I tie every episode together? So kind of what is a book or a show that you have read or watched recently that everybody should know about? Uh, Okay. So Jeff and I are actually both reading this. I don't know if this would be his answer, but we're reading. It, it, um, it would have been, but yes. <laughs> uh, Malcolm Gladwell's Talking to Strangers. So good. Oh my. Okay. So, so tough. good. So it's tough. One. So good. So, so tough. So great. Super heavy and interesting and mind expanding and imploding. And I'm reading it, but also um, the audio book apparently is like, made like a podcast so like they pull in extra stuff and it's su- also super amazing um it's super interesting and I feel like I've learned so much and also now know nothing um <laughs> at the right. same time. everything it's- we thought about human connection is yeah. <laughs> it, it was my number one book of 2019 I love oh my gosh so we're both reading that now and it's very it's woo, it's a good one 
Yeah. Yeah. And and we're part of this book club from this guy, Eric Bailey, who wrote this book called Cure for Stupidity. And I and we I also really enjoyed that book because it was mm-hmm. it was the first time I really was challenged to be like, am I going into this conversation to understand or are I going to this conversation to win and be right? And you can't do both. And that has helped me m- plenty when I'm like, okay, I'm trying to understand. No, you're not, Jeff. You're still trying to win. You're still trying to win. And to actually call myself on my own BS is really powerful because you have to do it constantly throughout the entire conversation. Oh, I like that. I'm going to, so Malcolm Gladwell, I've read every one of his books. He is one of my absolute heroes of the moment. I love him. Um, and, but I'll check out that book. And then I am huge on philanthropy. So I'm really would love to know what's a charity that each of you just really would love the world to know more about and, and to, to support in, in whatever way. I was like, just Jeff, I was like, I said the book thing first. You want to go first? Oh, yeah, sure. I'll go. Um, this is an interesting answer. So, um, ProPublica, I really appreciate. I was introduced to this by a uh, former colleague, Steve, who, it, which is, it's all about uh, media transparency. And it's all about, you know, like making sure that media gets a voice, especially, you know, in the last few years. So I really do love supporting that organization, but more what I'm fascinated by, and this is actually another book that's worth recommending, is is a book called Winners Take All from a non Gerda Haradas, um, where he talks about the challenge of philanthropy and how mm. there is a lot of elite philanthropic services that are happening right now. We're giving away more money than we ever have in the world. And we have the most massive amount of discrepancy when it comes to wealth. So how is that happening? And how are we rethinking how we do philanthropy? Because there's a lot of companies, a lot of a lot of people like Jeff Bezos that are that will give fifteen billion dollars to or you know whatever to like some Harvard elite organization, and then exploit everyone for hundreds of billions of dollars. So like we have to be, so that's the part that I'm, I'm, so I'm now trying to rethink philanthropy from that standpoint and being like- Oh, interesting. Yo, like we, if if elites simply paid their taxes, we wouldn't have to have as much philanthropy. Got it. I like the ProRepublica and I'll check that book out too, so. Yeah, winners take all. Winners take all, very cool. Lauren? Um, okay. So I think I, I don't know if I'm quoting this correctly. I was like, I don't, I don't officially know if they're a nonprofit. I was like, they take donations. I feel like they are. Um, but there's a, I don't know a a deep amount of this, but, um, I think, what are they called? Uh, Holla, Holla back, not ER, but Holla back. Um, they are a company that I believe is like trying to promote uh, access and accessibility of people with disability and things like that. And I know about them because they partnered with AAJC, which is like Asian Americans for Justice, mm-hmm. um, recently. And a couple weeks ago, um, I took a bystander intervention training that they're doing for free right now. Mm. And they're open to donations because they're trying with the rise in violence of all kinds. Mm-hmm. Um, they're trying to make more free public trainings available. So they're like, we're open to donations because they're trying to hire more volunteers and trainers and stuff like that. And I think it's really great because they make it a really great space. Um, I, they make it actionable. They make it anonymous. So people can um, like type it. The, the chat's not public, but you can type and they like read people's answers of like, here are some people's suggestions and things. Don't forget, like, that's a great answer, but also don't forget that you should ask yourself this when you're doing that thing. And they have mm. scenarios that they go through. It's very tangible and real and they're making it free to people because it's needed which i really appreciate Mm -hmm. um and they're they're doing good work and again responding to need and people's want like especially with um a lot of the people of color and asian hate and things that are happening right now um there was a huge influx of interest and people trying to figure out what they like what can i do as an individual who's not in government um, and just around. And a lot of people 
flocked to this paired up training that had happened that they were running like once a month or something like Mm -hmm. that. They've been doing it for a while and they responded by like, increasing the capacities and adding more trainings. And it's not, they want to do it because it's good work. And mm-hmm. I really appreciate that. And I think that they do a, a really good job. Um, is anything perfect? No, but like they do, they do a really good job. It's interactive. It's engaging. You have takeaways. It's a safe space. They're informing you without making you feel like you don't know anything. Mm-hmm. And um, it's really cool. So ho- holla back. Oh, and, and I just thought of two other organizations. Stop Asian Hate is really doing a really amazing job around API awareness, especially around mm-hmm. the violence. But then I forgot this other one, Braver Angels. Oh, yeah. Mm. Braver Angels is an organization that's bringing people from the right and left together to have conversations. Conversations. Yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah. And they that's and when point. they have a Zoom meeting, they bring 10 Republicans and 10 Democrats and some independents, and then they put out a question and they, they facilitate a conversation and they've been oh, trying wow. to do that for the last year, year and a half. Braver angels, I think, dot org. But, well, yeah. I, all, all of these will be in the show notes. So anybody who is interested in finding out more about them, will put the links to those organizations in the show notes. You can find those at ven.zone. And I just, did you guys have uh, something that you, I wanted to give you an opportunity to give something to the audience, if you had something to, to share with the audience that, on how they can find you? Yeah, I mean, you, you could go to either of our websites and, you know, Lauren and I, because we're now just starting to roll out this how to navigate difficult conversations workshop. Well, we're happy to hop on a, a call with you to actually talk about your process and see what you're actually doing. Even if we don't work with you, let's just help you solve the problem. So if people reach out to us, they either can go to rediscoveryourplay.com or cultivatorofcuriosity.com. And, and let's just have a conversation and see if we can help you. Because at the end of the day, we're truly trying to bring shared humanity back to the workplace and build connection. And we want to do that. And if we get paid to do it too, sweet. Love it. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you, Lauren and Jeff. I really appreciate you guys taking time to be out of your schedule and to all of the people listening or watching the show. We really appreciate you. And we really want to thank you for gifting us with the greatest gift that you can give us, which is your time. So as I have said on the show already, and as I say at the end of every show, just remember that negotiation is nothing more than a conversation about a relationship and you cannot win a relationship, but you can get more value out of it. Happy negotiating. And we'll see you on the next episode of In the Ven Zone. Have a great day, everyone. Take care. Thank you for joining us for this episode of In the Ven Zone with Christine McKay. We invite you to visit our website at www.ven.zone to access the show notes and other helpful resources. Empower the negotiator in you and successfully level the playing field. Join us again next time here on In the Venzone.